Our goal is in some ways to knock the grocery store on its ass. We know that people are shopping for coffee there most of the time, and we think that we're providing a solution that that way of selling coffee is structurally incapable of solving. Hi, I'm Mike Lackman. I'm the CEO at Trade Coffee, and I'm here with City of Saints Coffee Roasters in Bushwick. Trade was founded on a really simple idea that a lot of people really love coffee, that there's awesome businesses that make great coffee, and that those two things weren't coming together well enough. And that if we use technology and we use what we were good at to connect those two parties, consumers and coffee roasters, we could help a lot more people make really great coffee at home and help coffee roasters run better businesses. I'm uh, John Johnson. I'm the coffee director at City of Saints Coffee. City of Saints Coffee, we've been roasting for about seven years now. And the name came from uh, our love of coffee from Ethiopia, big coffee center. And uh, that was called the City of Saints. When we looked at the coffee industry, we asked people how they wanted coffee to taste. Almost everybody said some combination of dark, strong, and robust. And that just doesn't mean anything. Dark just means there's not milk in it. Strong just means it's not decaf. And robust doesn't mean anything at all. And so if there was a way to help consumers easily understand what's going on with this industry, what makes one coffee different from another, why it's worth a certain amount of money, then we know that they want this in shops. When it's prepared uh, by baristas, when it's out of the home, it's a really premium product in most cases. In my parents' generation, it was mountain-grown coffee, and it was about trying to relate you to the origin. And then when you look at what Starbucks did, it brought cafe culture to the U.S., and it was about trying to transport people to Europe. And today, I think there's a big opportunity in bringing people all over the country to places like Bushwick. We pretty much were selling coffee exclusively in like the tri-state area. And uh, you know, with trade, we have packages going all over the country, and it kind of exposes our brand to people who you know, would never hear of us otherwise. Most websites today that sell things are actually built on the architecture of an old paper catalog. And what we try to do is take this more data-driven approach where we understand people, and then we present them with options that are really simple. That's what e-commerce should be. If we made it really fresh, if we got it delivered in a way that was really simple and really personalized, that we'd get a lot of loyalty. And what we've always said from the beginning is that if we could build really durable customer relationships, we can always afford to overinvest in them. 18 months in, we'd only sold a little under a million bags of coffee. In the last 18 months, we will have sold almost another four or five million bags. And with that scale, we've only had to add about 10 or 15 roasters. Each one of our roasters has actually been expanding the coffees that they're making, and we've been able to use data as a way not just to tailor experiences to consumers, but also to help our partners. It's interesting with trade to kind of see like, really like where the consumer at large, like where their tastes are. Like when I'm making a decision on which coffees to buy, you know, I'm taking into account like, you know, all the data that we have on like what has sold in the past, like uh, what price points, you know, are selling and and like what the co what the consumer is really kind of like, you know, in the mood for. Today, we started with this group of roasters who could make certain coffees and we could ship them. The future of our business is going to look a lot more like building a roasting cloud. When there was a hurricane in, in Louisiana, that roaster was, had no electricity for a week. In an analog world, we would just have somebody subscribe to that one roaster, that's the thing they get, and then they'd get no coffee for a week. Today, we can dynamically find different coffees that are a perfect fit for those same consumers. Roaster in Louisiana comes back up to speed, we can actually push their volume up to help them catch up to the revenue they lost when they were out of business for a week. Especially during the pandemic, like trade really helped us because, you know, we went from having like established great customers to just like nothing overnight. We honestly went from like overnight roasting, you know, on average 15,000 pounds of coffee a week to roasting like 2,000 pounds of coffee. Trade was like, our one account at that time that was like, hey, uh, we need a lot of coffee, <laughs> you know, because everybody else was like, oh my God, like cancel all of our orders. One of the remarkable things about what Howard Schultz did when he built Starbucks 
was that he took something that was really rare and really exceptional and he made it accessible to everybody. We think we can do the same thing. Take something that's really special, a coffee that was made by an artist with a story, art that looks like an album cover, connection to a local community and a Main Street business. And if we can make that available to people for, I don't know, six, seven extra dollars a month versus buying old stuff at the store, that's a really big idea. And if that big idea can make the roasters and their growing partners a bigger part of the coffee economy, I think that we're building something really memorable, something really consequential, and something that we can be really proud of. A lot of people ask us how we find the best roasters. And one of the things that we've been really fortunate about, especially in the last couple of years, is that a lot of roasters have been coming to us. And what we end up doing is looking at who's making it really well, what matters to us around the ethics in terms of how they treat their employees domestically, how they source coffee internationally, um, how can we give an opportunity for communities that are very often underrepresented in the coffee community, how can we get more coffee being made closer to more people so the delivery becomes more reliable. In, in the first couple of years here was when we started some experimentation around giving roasters data to make new coffees. They started making the coffees that we asked them to make and they became some of the best selling SKUs in their home markets. The biggest challenge we had was definitely the, at the beginning stages, just getting enough momentum where we could provide enough volume to roasters that we were worth spending time with and iterating through and creating a good enough product for customers that we could have the loyalty we needed to grow a business. And there was definitely a phase where we had to create some coffees that the industry wasn't selling or we had to position things differently than the industry had done before in order to make things work. And there were points where you had to get out of the office and hit the road. And we flew around the country going roaster to roaster. We had even partners that were great partners with today in the first wave tell us, no, I don't want to do that. And we had to find enough people to say yes that we could put a product to market. But now I don't think the challenges are easier. They're just different. The business is more complicated. Uh, you've got a business, not a team now that's growing. The standards our employees have for how we run the business are growing. When we think about the future of coffee at trade, we think about making the places where we're succeeding today much more accessible to much larger numbers of people. We always have new events that we're working on and it's the fall here in New York right now, so we're really getting ready for our gifting season. When people ask me what keeps me up at night, when you're in an early business, there's very little momentum. This business does not deserve to exist yet. And if you don't cover a lot of those little things that could go wrong, there's no department full of people, there's no office in another country, there's no process that someone set up 10 years ago that's gonna keep those things from falling apart. If you have so much belief in your instinct that it has to work, you're really afraid of it failing. If you think the instinct means it's something that's worth trying, you wanna know if it's gonna fail as fast as possible because you don't wanna to get too far ahead of yourself and invest a lot of time and energy at something that's not gonna be sustainable. Like cupping, the way that we analyze our coffee, the way that we get our data. We assumed, not knowing the industry well enough when we started, that roasters could tell us how the coffee's tasted. Truth is that it's pretty subjective. And when we use that data to make decisions, our outcomes weren't very good. So we said we have to ship it all to a central place. We have to have people who are amazing at understanding and tasting and cupping coffee, cup this stuff, and they need to ascribe data to what we're trying to sell. Oftentimes you're so bought into the passion behind the instinct that you're actually ignoring some of the stuff that might be going wrong because you're trying so hard to get to the end point quickly, you don't want to let anything get in your way. It, you really need to start by listening to the people who are closest to the customers, the customers themselves, the needs of our roaster partners, and the more you listen for what they're really telling you, the more you can build those things. This is a business that started with an empty room dilemma. We needed to have enough roasters do enough work with us that we could put a really great product in front of customers. And we needed to have enough customers that it was worth roasters' time. That's really hard. It just takes a lot of willpower and a lot of personal salesmanship and a lot of dedication and even some unsustainable stuff in the first few months to be able to bridge that gap. There was just a lot of skepticism that we'd be able to create a model that would work. And more than anything else, we, we, we cut, a, cut against the orthodoxy for how a lot of people were trying to build consumer businesses. I, I think if you have a model that is so obvious, that it is a great idea and it's guaranteed to work and nothing can go wrong, my guess is there's 80 people all trying to do the same thing right now. Where 
we know that our idea is crazy enough that there frankly aren't a lot of people willing to try to do it. And that gave us some space to really stick to our guns in terms of brand discipline, in terms of the part of the market we wanted to work with, in terms of the way we wanted to bring things to market, the speed with which we wanted to build our team. And I think that's a big part of the reason that we have what we have today.